makes a woman tick. Now, please turn your Bible with me to 1 Peter 3 and verse 7. 1 Peter 3 and verse 7. And here the Bible says, Husbands, dwell with them. Husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. All through the scripture, God has instruction on how we ought to do relationship. And there in Peter, it says to have a good relationship, you must have a knowledge of the man and a knowledge of the woman. So men must master the art of womanhood. And the woman must master the art of manhood. Dwell with them according to knowledge, the Bible says. Another rendering of the Bible puts it this way. Dwell with them in an understanding way. Friends, let me tell you this today. We cannot have a great marriage except we understand our spouse. And I've been in the church for many years. And I always hear about you have to know your wife. You got to know your husband. But friends, many times we don't get an explanation of what that means. But that is very important. Dwell with them according to knowledge, the Bible says. Do you know what the number one cause of divorce is? The number one cause of divorce is incredible ignorance. If you don't know it, you can't do it. And to marry without a knowledge of your partner. Without a knowledge, if the man is to marry without a knowledge of women, of, of, of women in general, if the woman is to marry and there was no knowledge of how a man functions, how, um, how, how his inner world looks like, what is his love map? You don't understand his psychological makeup. You're going to have a hard time doing marriage. And this is why I say even to young people, to marry without proper premarital preparation is like flying an aircraft, but you never did a course in aviation. <laughs> Would you want to fly with such a person? Oh, it's a layman. He, he, you know, he, we just saw him on the road and he just decided to come and sit in the cockpit of the aircraft. Did you do, did you do a course in aviation? Oh, no, I don't need that. You know, I just love aircraft. So I want to fly. Would you join him on that aircraft? You could not be in your right mind and decide to go on that aircraft. But friend, did you know it's the same way not more than 90% of people do a relationship? They say, well, I like you. <laughs> Just like we say, I like aircraft. I like you. So let's hook up and see where it takes us. Then soon after they get married. And they feel the hormones rushing through their, through, through their brain, you know. And all the dopamine and the serotonin secreted and they feel good. They hold each other's hand and they say, wow, if loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right, you know. And they say, well, let's come and legitimize this relationship in marriage. And they go and they get married. Get married only on the basis of hormones. Oh, I love you. Really? Many times, friends, it's only hormones. And so people get married based on, on that ecstatic feeling, that excitement, infatuation. And they go into marriage. Do you know the shelf life of infatuation? Oh, friends, 18 months average. 18 months. 
It doesn't matter how much money he has. It doesn't matter how pretty she is. The shelf life of infatuation. If, all, if that's all you go into marriage with. 18 months after. And you say, whoa, who did I marry? I don't know him. And so, friends, then they start to have serious problems. And this is why we have this program tonight. You must understand each other. Now, men and women are wired differently. We are different creatures. And the man may say, well, that's how your needs are met based on how my needs are met. A lot of men are doing that. Oh, I'm going to meet your needs. And he meet, try to meet her needs based on how he thinks his needs are met. And then she's still miserable. Why? That's not how her needs are met because she is wired differently. And so, friends, it's important then that we know what makes a man tick and what makes a woman tick. We have to understand needs. All right? And so let's move through a few um, ideas here as we talk about it. First of all, I want to talk to the men as to how to treat your woman. And take it very seriously, friends, because God takes it very serious. I want to highlight a few things. Number one, when talking to a woman, she needs to talk. She needs conversation. That's number one. How is a man different? Well, you see, a man likes to work. <laughs> he goes out and he works hard. Many times he becomes a workaholic. Only to discover after a while he has no time to spend with her. He's too busy. Don't you see? I'm busy trying to make a living. What's wrong with you? <laughs> and they get into a kind of a verbal, verbal tug of war. But I don't see you. You're too busy to get up in the morning and home late. They never thought about that before they got married. And so we have to understand, friends, for a man, it doesn't matter the urge to work because you have to work. You, you have to sustain life. That's important. Okay, as a man, she expects that of you to be a provider. But the point is you have to create balance. Balance. If you're working hard, call her on the phone sometimes, talk to her. You must create balance. So you spend time with her. For she needs to talk. Do you know what the number one cause of divorce among the elite is? The number one cause of divorce among the families of the elite. The superstar, the movie stars, and the, and the hedge fund managers, and all those folk who have huge responsibility, the CEOs. Lack of quality time with each other. Oh, friends, many ladies would quickly give up the big house and the big car if they could even go back to their first six months of marriage. If they didn't have all of that, but they had each other walking in the park and could have good conversation with. So there needs to be balance. A woman needs to talk. And why does she talk? She talks to connect with you. She talks to unburden her heart. And she talks to sort, S-O-R-T, to sort her thoughts. If she cannot have you to have conversation with, you have a miserable woman. Hello today. But guess what? If you are a good conversationalist, she'll adore you. For she must talk. So that's one of the things that make women tick. Also, another thing, friends, for women is honesty. Honesty. When you start to relate to a woman, you must develop a certain mindset. And, you, and we have to make that transition as men. Because some of us have been single for what? 25 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40, 35 years. So when we enter marriage, we still we, we think we're still single. We want to live on our own terms. Go out and come in as we used to. Nobody should ask me, where are you? When are you coming home? I'm my own man. Why are you so inquisitive? Things like that. Many have not made the transition from singleness 
to married life. And it's a problem. And because of that, they don't feel they should be accountable to another. But listen, friends, when you get married, you are joined. J-O-I-N-E-D. Joined. You are no more your own man. No, you are not accountable to somebody. So if they call on the phone and say, where are you? Gently and kindly. Share your whereabouts. Because guess what? One thing in a marriage. Never give your wife or your husband for that matter. Never give your spouse a reason to distrust you. Amen. So you must live to what? Preserve trust in the relationship. Very important. Must live to preserve trust. And so we call it H-O-T. All right. She's hot. All right. What does the acronym HOT mean? Honesty, openness, and transparency. Your life must become an open book. No more hiding your phone and your password. Oh, oh, why are you checking my phone? Really? No. Your phone is her phone. I agree, you know, friend, that sometimes there's privacy. But privacy is different from secrecy. Did you know that there are some men who even sleep with the phone in their pocket? And when it rings, they rush to the bathroom. Oh, and they, and, and they lower their voice. Then she says, who was that? Nobody. Really? Friends, that's not transparency. You, will, you would be having a hard road to hold with that woman. mm 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 mm, -mm. So remember, friends, honesty, openness, and transparency, key, crucial in living happily ever after with that woman. Amen? She needs honesty. Another thing a woman needs is leadership from you. I like to talk about the three Ps. She needs what? She needs a provider. She needs a protector. And she needs a priest. She needs leadership. Well, do I have to do everything? Uh, no, she's an accountant. She can take care of the money. Of course. It doesn't mean you have to do everything. You see, there's something about competence. You may not be competent in, a, in certain things. Allow her to do what she's competent in. That's all right. That's how you do it. You delegate the duties and the responsibilities in the home. But guess what? Overall, it is your job as the man to ensure that things run well in the home and all the structures are in place. Amen. That's your job as the man to make sure that things are in order. Do you know what the worst word husband means? Oh, study that in the original language. The word husband really means house band. Amen. So you create a band around the family. Amen. You hold the family together. Amen. Leadership. A woman admires a man who takes charge. And especially, right? What kind of leadership do you offer? Supportive leadership. Spiritual leadership. Call the family to family worship. Amen. Call the family to worship. That's important. She loves that. In her mind, she says, wow. I have a husband on whom I can depend. He will take the lead when it comes to dignity, propriety, order, spiritual stability. He takes the lead. I'm a fortunate woman. That makes that woman tick. Takes the, take the lead in your home. Every woman, friends, you know, except, of course, you know, she has a strong aversion to God. <laughs> except she's an atheist. But every woman, generally speaking, a woman likes a man who can offer spiritual leadership. Some problems in the family and you feel incapable of dealing with. Let's pray. You call the family to prayer. 
you lead them to the gate of heaven. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Oh, woman loves that kind of a man. And that makes her tick. So overall, I want to use a little analogy, man. Remember this. You set the mood by which the family function. Leadership. You set the mood in the home. You set the temperature. One of the things I like to say, the man is the thermostat. He regulates the heat. He sets the temperature. The woman, on the other hand, is the thermometer. She tells you how hot it is. Amen. Oh, yes. And sure enough, she's going to tell you. If it's hot, you will know. And if it's cold, you will know too. So you are the thermostat, man. Oh, she's looking for you to keep the, the temperature warm and livable and beautiful. Another thing I want to tell you about ladies, men, you must understand. A woman is a responder. She responds. She responds to the leadership you offer. She responds. Amen. If you give her good treatment, she'll respond. And if you give her bad treatment, if you give her frustration, she's going to give you. <laughs> she's going to give you earnest. Amen. Oh, yeah. You will know as well. So, man, it is no mistake when God endows you with the responsibility, with the position as head of that home. Amen. You must lead. Another thing, a woman loves affection. I want to talk about this a bit. A woman loves affection. And I want to include another word, affirmation. Woman loves affection, friends, and affirmation. Well, you see, I was grown up in the jungle. I'm rough, the man may say. But when you get married, that will not work in marriage. You've got to be a gentleman. Amen. Listen. Don't take it lightly, friends, and don't take your wife for granted. I know it may not be popular. You may not see it happening around you. But I want to talk to your heart, man. A woman loves good treatment. And if you know that you can't give her good treatment, don't marry her. Amen. So now that you are married to her, treat her well. Flip this script. Forget about what others are doing. Eh? Oh, nobody's doing it. You start. And you start treating her with tender, loving care. Open the car door for her. Amen. Open the door as she passes through. Show to the world. Show to the world that you are Serious about loving her. In other words, love her like you mean it. Amen. I love that. Love her like you mean it. I remember in the early days, my wife and I sometimes you would even have a challenge. Sweetheart, let us see who can out love the other. Amen. That's how you do it. You challenge each other for good. As a matter of fact, there's a passage of scripture. That encourages that. Romans 12 and verse 10. You know what the Bible says there? Be kindly affectioned. One to another. With brotherly love. In honor. Preferring one another. What is that word? Give each other preference. In other words. Put their needs and priorities above your own. Amen. I like what another, another rendering of the, uh, of the scripture puts it this way. It says. Outdo each other. In showing honor. So it doesn't matter how you were grown up. I'd like you now to, to deprogram 
your mind. Yes, that program based on your upbringing, based on your friends and the media over time, you have a program downloaded in your brain that is driving you to do marriage wrong. Yes, you saw your dad being harsh to your mom. You saw your mom being harsh to your dad. And you grow up now, deciding that you, your only option is to replicate the cycle. But now, you must understand what's happening in your mind, friend. It is saved in your subconscious, but you must override that. The Bible says you can be changed by renewing your mind. That's how we are changed. You have to take a different mindset. And that's why I'm talking to you tonight, man. Take a different mindset. If you marry, love like you mean it. And no more about this roughness. Amen. Some men are rough. They don't know even to talk to the woman. What happened? What wrong with you? I'm not telling you that already. Oh, you're so hard to hear. What happened to your ears? Friend, this is a kind of communication in many homes. More than 70% of homes, the communication is negative. Friends, it must never be when we come in the church. God has given us a formula. Look at the Bible, the ultimate marriage manual. The Bible is replete with instructions on how to treat your wife. The Bible says, live happily with the wife of your youth. Amen. Psalm 128 and verse 3 declares, he says, your wife shall be as a fruitful vine. Not a withering vine. A fruitful vine. You want her to be fruitful? Ask yourself the question, what kind of soil do I plant her in? Amen. What kind of environment do I place her in? What kind of atmosphere do you create in the home? You cannot have a summer wife, a summer wife, if you bring home winter weather. Amen. No way. If you want a summer wife, you must bring home warm weather. Amen. That's the atmosphere. That you create for her. And then. According to Psalm 128 verse 3. Then she can become a fruitful vine. Men it's all in your hands. To make your marriage beautiful. If you want to make that woman tick. Amen. And to see her radiance. And to see her beautiful. You. You do it. There's another passage, you know, uh, Proverbs. Do you know, sometimes you underestimate the power of the man's presence in the home. I could spend some time if I had the time to tell you about that. A man has a powerful influence just by his presence in the home. Look at the children. The woman talks three, four times. The children don't even matter her sometimes, but the man talks once. I could give you some statistics right now. In the homes where the mother alone is Christian, 17, 1, 7 percent of the time, the children stay in the church. But in the homes where the dad alone is Christian, 75 percent of the time, the children remain in the church. What does that tell you? The man has a powerful influence in that home. His very presence commands authority. Use your authority to lead your family aright. The woman responds. Did you know, my friends, by and large, a woman becomes based on the treatment of the man. By and large. Of course, there are except exceptions to the rule, for there are some women who are hard to tame. I know that. They're rough too. I know that. But let me just tell you something. If the man knows the formula well, he can change the paradigm of his home. Amen. And so I want to leave that now. That's for the men. All right. Let's move on now to the other, to the other marathon, right? As we talk now about the woman. Amen. All right. 
ladies, what does, what makes the man tick? Oh, you got to understand that too. Mm -mm 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 -mm. What is it that makes her tick, man? Well, sorry, I'm talking to the ladies now. So what are the things that make him tick? All right. Oh, oh, okay. I must, I must remind myself now. All right. I'm speaking to the women tonight, right now. So ladies, is there a work for you to do, ladies? What is it that a man needs? The first thing is that. There's a passage there, Ephesians 5, 33. The second part of the text. You know what it says? It says, wife, see that you reverence your husband. That word reverence means respect. The man's most important need is for respect. Well, pastor, I can't respect him. Look at he does. He's not even a man. Look at him. What's wrong with him? He doesn't even know how to be a man. <laughs> if you said that to your husband, tells me you don't understand him. But you must understand him if you are to live with him. So I'm going to tell you this respect him and guess what he may not be doing all that is expected of him but you respect him still why because you are respectful amen it's about you it's not necessarily about what he does it's about you amen you respect him because you are respectful so you will not reduce yourself by calling him certain names Sometimes we think, you know, it is what is done to us that reveal who we really are. No, the Bible tells us it is what proceeds from within that, that betray who we really are. Yes. So if you are a respectful person, only respect comes from you. In other words, you live like an honorable person for your honorable there are certain words you don't use because you are honorable you're a woman of class you're a woman of dignity i know what you're thinking but pastor what is all these problems is giving me how to deal with it you don't re deal with it by reducing yourself amen no way i like what michelle obama used to say when she says when they go low you go high because that's who you are you're a woman of dignity. There's another statement Martin Luther King used. He says, he says what? He said, <laughs> never let a man drag you so low as to make you hate him. Oh, that's powerful. You must maintain who you are. Okay? You respect him because you are respectful. But pastor, how do I solve the problems he's giving me? He's cheating on me. Look at him. He doesn't bring home the money. What's wrong with him? He abuses me. He calls me names. He even hides the, the bank book from me. He doesn't even give me money. He abuses me financially as well. Look at him. You know the way you fix that? You do it the right way. You get help. Amen. If it's too much for you to do, you get help. And I want to encourage you ladies with something. A lot of people don't go for therapy. Before you marry, especially those young ones, before you marry, you must ask the man. If you're having problems in your marriage, will you go for, for help? Will you go for counseling? And if he says no, you don't marry him. Amen. Can you know what? You alone can't do it. When your car is in disrepair, do you find a mechanic or do you do it yourself? When you have cancer in your stomach and you have a brain tumor, do you try to perform your own operation? No. You see a physician. You see a surgeon. 
So why is it when you're having marriage problem, you sit down in it and suffer all the days of your life as though you can fix it? No, you need a coach. You need help. You need a therapist. You need a counselor. You need a pastor. Get somebody. By the way, as a matter of fact, let me tell you, ladies, if you sit down in silence and do nothing about it, you are only enabling him to get worse. In other words, <laughs> there's something about marital problems, friends. If you do nothing about them, they don't go away normally. Mm -mm -mm. They normally get worse. So I am imploring ladies, if you're in a bad marriage, don't sit back and do nothing. That's not God's will for you. You're not sentenced to a toxic, failing, broken, fractured marriage. No. You're married to be happy. And if you are not happy, get help until the problems are resolved. The man is beating you, for example, hurting you, and you sit back. Oh, what am I going to do? Really? That's not marriage. And that's not being a Christian either. Amen. When you're a Christian, you value yourself enough to get help. Amen. And you get help until you are helped. Amen. I hope that means something, right? So the point is, back to what I was saying, what? You respect him as you live with him. When you can't do it any longer, then it's time to get help. Okay, get a third party so you can talk about your problems too. Sometimes, you know, you need a third party, you know, to, to tell him what you want to tell him. He heard you talking for so long. <laughs> The words mean nothing more to him anymore. Sometimes you got to get a third party. And sometimes too, you are able even to express yourself in, a, in an environment that is neutral. Okay? And that's important. You are able to talk while he listens. He is able to talk while you listen. Did you know it is sometimes in counseling some people for the first time in five, ten years, their partner heard of what they were really dealing with all along the first time they have been able to express themselves in counseling and sometimes after that two three sessions the marriage is solved because they got it off their heart amen so there's a place for coaching friends and for help right the bible says as iron sharpeneth iron so one man the countenance of his friend don't sit down in misery right? so respect him as you live with him Another thing, ladies, watch your tongue. Amen. <laughs> Did you know it is said that a man's ego is the most fragile thing in the universe? And Did you know that one of the most effective ways that a woman disrespects her man is with her tongue? Some ladies, they have no control anymore over their tongue. You see, they fight with their tongue. And they think it, they just say it. Until after a while, that man, that man suffers. He wants to make the marriage better. But she's so absorbed in misery. And she has hurt him for so long. That there's no turning back in his mind. I've spoken to folk already, friends, in counseling. The lady wants the marriage, but the man said, I'm sorry, I'm tired. Over the years, I've been hurt so much with your tongue. I cannot go back into that. Friends, let me tell you this, your tongue. You've got to bridle it, amen. You don't know what to do with your tongue, friends? Shift your focus from the false. From the irritations of your husband. Shift your focus from that. And then you start to do now. You start identifying. Searching for. Looking for the good he does. And celebrate him for it. Amen. Let me tell you. Like. Like amazement. That man you'll see him turn around. In ways that baffles your mind. Yes. In ways that amaze you, that baffle your mind. Understand something about the brain. 
people are happy, not when they are told how bad they are. No, they are happy when they are told how good they are, when they are affirmed for the good they do. That's the brain. And you know why? Let me tell you a little biology here, friends. When, a, when you say good things to somebody, positive words, it causes the secretion of hormones, neurotransmitters in the brain, like dopamine. It's a feel-good hormone. It's secreted in the brain and it makes them feel good. Just like when people who take cocaine, why do they take cocaine? Yes, the cocaine has the same effect. It, it causes secretion of dopamine and they feel good for a while. I spoke with folk who have been hooked on drugs for years. They said, you know something? I spend my life chasing that feeling, that dopamine. Friend, let me tell you something. When you celebrate your spouse, when you praise him, when you praise him, Sarah, is an example. Sarah, the Bible says, 1 Peter 3, verse 6, and Sarah calls him Lord. Oh, when was the last time you looked on your husband and said, my Lord? Amen. When you praise him, the dopamine is secreted. He feels good. And you know what happens then? He always wants to have you in his life. If he was thinking about divorcing you, he's thinking again. For you, make him feel good. Amen. By celebrating him. No wonder the Bible is emphatic on it. Proverbs. Her husband praiseth her. Everything with God is about praising your spouse and praising each other. The Bible says even God himself, he says, God inhabits the praise of his people. Amen. People love to live in an atmosphere of praise. So spend time praising your husband. And that brings me to the next point. The number one, the, uh, a great need of a man. A great need of a man is for affirmation. Yes, same thing. When he does something good, don't be quiet. Don't wait until he dies to go and eulogize him. Amen. At the funeral? No. Did you know that some men, man, if they could just come back from the casket, you know, and to hear the nice words the wife is uttering about him, he maybe would wonder, who is that? Who is that? Maybe he would even come back alive. <laughs> In other words, friend, don't wait until he dies to tell him. Tell him now. I know why many people don't do it easily. It doesn't come easy. You know why? We easily gravitate towards the negative. Oh, yes. That's how the brain is. There's something about the brain. I spend my life studying this. And the only conclusion I can come to is that we're born in sin and shaped in iniquity. It's amazing, friends. We gravitate towards the negative. Somebody does us 99 good. 99 good things, but the 1% bad thing, we remember it. We will not let it go. We even malice them for it, and we forget the 99. The natural man gravitates towards what's negative. You know this in life. That's what the brain is. We're made that way, the natural man. But to change that, we must work on it. We must rehearse it. No wonder they say that rehearsal is a behavioral technique. You want, to, you want to adopt a new behavior? Rehearse it. Go before the mirror and say, I love my husband. You are so wonderful. If I were to do it again, it would still be you. You are so great. I know you were good, but I didn't know you were so good. Is that right? Practice it. Amen. And when you come from the room, man, and you see him, you say, honey, you are good. And then you walk away. Listen to me. Two minutes after he's going to come. He's, he's going he's gonna to be walking behind you. What did you say again? Amen. For he loves to hear. That he's doing good. Amen. That's what affirmation is. When we affirm somebody. We are ratifying. That it's a fact. That's what affirm means. Look up the word affirm. Study it. 
we are ratifying that it's the truth. So you build their confidence. You boost their self-esteem when you affirm them. Amen. If you, don't, if you want to make a man tick, do that. If I were to say nothing else, friends, I could say just that. Respect him and affirm him. Celebrate him. And create in your home a culture of appreciation. Amen. Coming down to the end here, I want to maybe just highlight a few things. Also, a man needs domestic support. Make a home, make the home happy and peaceful for him. All right, I'll just run through these very quickly. A man loves peace. Don't be always the nitpicky wife. A man loves peace. Amen. You know another thing a man loves that makes that make your husband tick? He loves your feminine spirit. Amen. He wants your feminine nature. Feminine as opposed to being boisterous and rough. No. A masculine man wants a feminine woman soft amen gentle sweet meekness even god declares it god attests to it he says a woman who is of a meek spirit she is in the sight of god of great price amen a meek spirit Feminine woman. Can I tell you something, ladies? You'd be amazed how a man loves a feminine woman. Amen. Oh, listen to me, friends. I did much research on that. Surveys have been carried out. Quest researches have, have been done with hundreds and hundreds of men. Why do you love a feminine woman? Listen to their answers, friends. They let me feel as though I'm the head of the home. They make me feel respected. They make me feel like I'm a real man. I can work hard for the appreciate it. Friends, ladies, listen now. Let me share this with you. You are never persuasive when you are aggressive. Amen. <laughs> you are never persuasive when you are boisterous. There's something about the feminine nature of a woman. Gentle. You'd be amazed. Such a woman. Mm -mm -mm. Such a woman. You break. <laughs> you break the hostility in that man you just you just merit him amen woman, a, a masculine man wants a feminine woman remember that i want to say something now about intimacy i'm not sure if i can say everything here i'm not sure of the nature of the audience but listen to me i want to talk to you ladies about this one day but one other thing that is important to a man is intimacy. I just want to say that. Some time ago, I did a research on the 10 health benefits for the man. God knows what he's about. Defraud ye not one another. He needs intimacy. And if you fail to meet that need, you are setting the stage for an affair. You are driving him in the arms of another woman. Ladies, I wish I could talk to your heart tonight. That man might be hurting. And you don't know. Because you don't understand the scope of that need that he has. Amen. A woman, man wants intimacy and fulfillment. Amen. Finally. A woman want, a man wants an attractive woman. Take care of yourself. If you are sick, go to the doctor. Amen. But take care of yourself. It's not right. Remember what the Bible says? What? If a man looketh on a woman, <laughs> what does that tell you? What he sees is important. A man is stimulated by sight. Take care of yourself. 
But also I want to tell you that there are four components of attractiveness that you must observe. How many? Four. The physical attractiveness is only one quarter of the pie. Amen. Number one, you have the physical attractiveness. You have intellectual. You have emotional. And you have spiritual. Intellectual, read some good books. Amen. Take charge of yourself. Bring something to the table. Have, be able to have good conversation with him. Amen. Emotional. How do you treat him? Amen. We talk about emotional intelligence. What is it? In a nutshell, what is it? It is, it answers the question, how do you make me feel when I'm in your presence? How do you make him feel when he's in your presence? Do you make him feel like a pea on the seashore like a nobody? Oh, or do you make him feel like a superstar? Amen. Listen to me. A lady who possesses emotional intelligence, oh, is a treasure to a man. Amen. How do you make him feel when he is in your presence? Do you know what a man wants most in a woman? He wants her. He wants her to treat him as her hero. Amen. <laughs> to celebrate him. You are his most ardent fan. Amen. You celebrate him. When he does something good on the job, no, you don't keep quiet. You say, wow, you did that. Ooh, I know you were good, but you exceeded my expectations. Wow, that's my man. That's how you treat a man. Ladies, go forth. Observe the principles of holy writ. Heed the counsel from the ultimate marriage manual, the Bible. When Toyota makes a car, they give an instruction manual. So you know how to maintain the car well. When God made marriage, he gave an instruction manual. Live happily with the wife of your youth. And wise, respect him, honor him, and together the children will be impacted. Oh, they will grow up to be well adjusted in society. And they will replicate the principles when they have their new families. Go forth, make the angels rejoice, create a little heaven in your home, and you will be a happy lad on your way to the kingdom. Ready to live with God and the angels above. Make your home a little heaven on earth. And live happily with the spouse of your life. Amen. God bless you. All right. Pa 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 Pastor Allen. We're going to detain you a little bit. Because we're going to play a song. Take some questions in the chat. Not a lot. Just a few. And I can see that you're a happy man. You're glowing tonight. <laughs> so, Brother Andrew, I'm going to ask you to play that song if we hold on. And then those who have your questions, present them. And we have the host will present. The, I'm going to, we're going to ask the host to present the questions to Pastor Allen. So go ahead and play that song for us, Brother Hardy, if we hold on. And we're going to ask you to put your questions in. Thank you. 
So there we are. Your questions. I see Sister Denise raised hand. Go ahead, Sister Denise, and ask your question. All right, Sister Denise. I'd like to ask you the first question, Pastor. Yes. It was a really nice, oh, Brother Jason has a question. He says, thanks for the presentation. Based on how you describe, go ahead, Brother Jason, and, and ask your question. It, it went from the screen. Brother Jason? Brother Burchell? Um, good night. Good night. Is sister, sister Burchell wrote it. <laughs> well, ask, man. Two become one. <laughs> read read it read the question I, it, it, it went from the screen okay all right so the question said um Thanks for the presentation, Pastor. Based on how you described how a woman should be, it, it takes me back historically to the way women were weak and afraid to even speak to their husbands. Women have evolved, and whilst we ought to be respectful to our spouses, I believe we are progressive. Are you saying men do not like independent women? Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, let me see if I answer that. I imagine this question was asked by a lady, right? Okay. Now, how you discover one should be women were weak and afraid to even speak to their husbands. Women have evolved. And while we ought to be respectful to our spouses, I believe we are progressive. Well, let me just say, friends, that I wouldn't say that those women were weak. I have never heard it in my lifetime, you know, studying the scripture, that those women were reflective of weak women. Um, I agree that sometimes it may appear as though they were, but, and of course, you know, you could cite eventually particular instance that I may not know of, be aware of, but I don't think it's that they were weak, okay? Um, so I just want to maybe address that point. Now, when I say women are progressive, let me say, friends, that I agree that cultures vary, but one thing is sure, <laughs> the culture of the Bible remains the same, okay? So here I'm really referring to biblical principles, Okay, um, so it's nothing about women being weak, but it's about um, be the type of woman who will allow the man to assume his rightful role as leaders in the home. And you don't have to be weak to do that, okay? And you do that based on consensus. You do that based on proper discussion, okay? And if the man is educated well, and if the man is a follower of God, he will never even make her feel weak. Okay, because really, who wants to marry to a weak woman? If you marry to a weak woman, then after a while, you start losing respect for her. Okay? Um, if you marry to a yes woman, then, and she agrees with everything you say, and she does not, she does not have an opinion that's different from yours, then one of you is unnecessary. It makes, it, 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 it kills marriage, and you lose respect for that woman. So no man wants to marry a weak woman, okay? So in my context here, there's nothing really about, you know, being a weak woman, but it's being a woman who, who, who is such that you complement each other as a, a, as a couple. I hope that Next. helps. Next question. Pastor Allen, I found very interesting when you declare that on their quarter of the attraction is physical. 
but the attraction, the other three quarter is found in the emotional, the spiritual, and intellectual. Yes. But we, we don't always practice that. That is it. And you can understand then why um, the marriage will, will, will just flourish. It will, it will be like a blaze for a while, a, a year or two. Then after that, it slowly dies. Okay? That is really the reason behind that. Because there's nothing to sustain the relationship going forward. As I said, the, the, the shelf life of infatuation is about 18 months. Right? We, 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 a person is maybe absorbed in the physical. But beyond that, you need more than that to keep the marriage going. And that is where now you have the intellectual, the spiritual, and the emotional side coming in. So who teach those who are getting married that? Ah. Because the church don't always teach that. Sorry? Who teach those who are planning to get married that? That's it. And this is why, friends, you know, I want to tell you this, that, you know, the more I study and the more I read the Bible and the more I have experience, and I spend my life studying marriage, guys, 27 years doing this, okay? Um, and when I say that, I mean full time, right? I go into a bookstore, I, find, I buy five books, three or four on family life. Um, and so I spend a lot of time studying this. And let me just tell a friend that as a people, we have been disadvantaged over the years because a lot of these things are not emphasized among us, very sadly. Okay? Um, a lot of are not emphasized. And the Bible has some ideas to on how to do that too, right? But sometimes we, we treat them with scant regard. For example, he says, the older women should teach the younger women. What does that mean? Those who have the experience and know what marriage looks like, the pitfalls and the challenges and the successes, the formula, teach the young one so that when they get in, they are not surprised. Think about it. A lot of people, even we have family seminar, a lot of people, singles may think, okay, that's for the married people. Think about that. When, for example... That's where the singles get their education about marriage in the marriage seminar. So they have to be there in the marriage seminars if they are to learn about marriage. Okay? And, and so sometimes we have it backward. The marriage seminars are really for the single people too because that's where they learn about how to do marriage later on. Things like that. So it's important. Good question. Good question. <laughs> So Any other question? question? All right, Pastor Allen, we'd like to say thanks for giving us one hour, 15 minutes of quality instructions this afternoon of your time. And, and, and in part in what keeps you so young and happy as it relates to the marriage? Give us two tips. Oh, man, I love that question. That gets me excited now. Mm -mm, I wish my wife was here, but let me just tell her friends. All right. And I'd like, I want to give you one big one. And of course, from that, we can draw a lot of other tips. Okay. But this is the main thing. The control of our tongue. That's it. Simply put. I like to make it very simple. That's it. Let me tell you how this works. Do you know, when we got married, my wife and I, I was a pastor long before I got married as some, many of you may know, pastoring Vaughnsfield Circuit and Sandy Bay Circuit and Hopewell with nine churches. So, I mean, it was a busy life then. Um, but of course, I used to teach family seminars even while I was a single person. Wednesday night, every Wednesday night, family seminars in all my churches. Sometimes three churches, to, two churches together. And then in the fourth instance, three churches together in a school room in Cold Spring. Flag staff and those places. Listen now, guys. So because of that experience, when I got married now, we we're able to set certain parameters in place. Because I've seen over time how the tongue, the wrong use of the tongue, has destroyed marriage. So when we got married, my wife and I, we made a commitment to each other. 
And this was the commitment that as long as we live, we will never, ever, by God's grace, under no circumstance, and at no time at all, and by no means, we will ever utter a negative word to each other, not even in the form of a joke. So help me God. That's it. Friends, <laughs> I want to tell you something. We did not hit the target 100% of the time, especially in the early days. You know, because there's no perfect marriage, right? But we tried. But after a while, it became second nature. And right now, friends, because we live to celebrate one another, listen to me. My wife and I, 16 years after, my wife and I are sweeter than when we're dating. Right now, the moment we jump in the car and she leaves in the morning, sometimes 10 o'clock, every time she gets a break, she calls me. <laughs> One morning, I dropped the kids recently. A few weeks ago, she dropped the kids and she comes. She says, sweetheart, where are you? It was 10 o'clock. She said, I finished a round already based on she you sometimes works on the road. She says, can we meet up 10 o'clock in the morning? I said, yeah, come in. And we met up at a gas station somewhere. We sat down and we had drink and we're dating again, making fun and laughing. And then she was on her way to work again. In other words, for every moment we look forward, we can't wait just to see each other, to spend time with each other. After 16 years, our relationship is better, sweeter, more exciting than when we're dating. And oh. primarily because of that simple principle. Thank you very much. So we wish you all the best. We will see you again. You shall return. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you. And God bless you for the instructions tonight thank you for having me man and thank you for all of you being on i'm so excited to see so many people tonight wow 39 strong 40 strong guys i want you to know that i love you very much and i like to speak to you from my heart and let me tell you something marriage can be beautiful but guess what tonight each of you just say to each other let's do let's start doing things differently Let's, we're going we're gonna to be happy couples, whatever it takes. And the first thing is that we will never utter a negative word to each other. But instead, we're going to start celebrating each other. Forget about the minor flaws and failures and celebrate each other. Make a big thing of the small accomplishments. Start there and your marriage will start to blossom. Love you. God bless you. God bless you and take care. Thanks for everybody for attending. It was a nice tutorial tonight. I shall adopt some of the things you have given us. God bless you. Thank you. Love you guys. Love you. And you play the part in song. And thanks again. Guys, we meet tomorrow evening at 7. We're going to have the, 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 the theme will be, or the topic will be praising God from the fire. It is going to be magnificent tomorrow evening. Praising God from the fire.